the QE2 we have uh, a multi-organ transplant program uh, that serves uh, all four Atlantic provinces. Uh, we do transplantation in, on the solid organ side of kidneys, uh, hearts and livers and pancreas. All these organs have similarities in, in the need to have evaluation and immune workup and monitoring prior to transplantation. In the setting of transplantation, we have to ensure that the donor and recipient, uh, as much as possible, have similar uh, HLA antigens and that then improves the outcome following transplantation. HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen and these are proteins or molecules uh, that all of us have on our cells and different individuals have different uh, proteins and they help us uh, defend uh, our bodies against uh, different infectious agents. Unfortunately, as an unintended consequence, when you put an organ from one person that has certain kinds of HLA into another person that has a different HLA, the donor HLAs are actually recognized as being foreign and the immune system mounts an extremely strong response to try and reject those cells and destroy them. And also we recognize that uh, the transplants last longer if they're matched for HLA. So the crossmatch test is a test that we have to perform to ensure that the transplant donor and recipient are actually compatible and the test measures the antibody in recipient serum that may be directed against donor uh, human leukocyte uh, antigens. Um, and this assay, this test, takes four to five hours uh, to perform. While we're waiting to identify who needs to get the transplant and then do the final cross-matching, these organs are undergoing relatively, you know, ongoing but slow damage. And so what we wanted to do is to see whether we could speed up this assay uh, and that's why we conducted these research studies to develop the Halifax protocol. And in fact, we're able to uh, reduce the assay time to under two hours and still have the same uh, or even better uh, uh, reliable test. And that's actually been shown to impact not only uh, how long the transplant lasts, but also the risk of dying of the patient undergoing the procedure. It's a very exciting time. Uh, we have a really a good collaboration with our clinical colleagues on the transplant team, and we work together very well to, to improve uh, uh, patient care as much as we can. Thank you all for coming today. It's a, a great opportunity. Uh, for you to hear about some groundbreaking work that's being done at the QE2 by one of my colleagues, Dr. Rob Lieske. I'm sort of the warm-up act, like when you go to a concert and there's, you know, the, the lesser name comes out front and kind of gets everybody uh, in the right mood. So that's, that's sort of my job today. The QE2 Foundation is extremely important to what we do here. Without it and your generosity, we really wouldn't be able to do the kinds of research and clinical care that we provide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about kidney transplantation and set you up to understand some of the stuff that Dr. Lieske is going to talk about. So transplantation is a medical miracle. It really is. And we've now been doing kidney transplants uh, in the world for more than 60 years, and it's impacted many people's lives. So here at the QE2, we have a multi-organ transplant program. So we do kidney transplants, hearts, livers, pancreases, and you can see that we serve all of the Atlantic provinces to have their kidney transplants done. Kidney transplant is a surgical procedure to put a healthy kidney from either a, someone who's alive, like a relative, or a deceased donor, someone who's passed away from either brain death or cardiac death, and put it into a person whose kidneys no longer function, because those people otherwise will either die or be condemned to being on dialysis. And so what do we do? Well, basically, your kidneys sit up here in the back. The transplanted kidney goes in actually down in your pelvis, and you can actually feel it in your, in your abdomen once it's, uh, once it's in. Why do we want a kidney transplant? It, obviously, it sounds simple, but actually patients live longer. They have better quality of life. They can go to work. They're not coming into the hospital three times a week for dialysis. It's better for their families and their children. They can travel. And interestingly, it's actually cheaper. So somewhere around $80,000 a year cheaper every year that the patient has a transplant. So in our, in our modern healthcare system, having transplants done and having them last longer 
uh, is really critical. So if you do get kidney failure, how do you end up on the transplant list? How do we get into this process? So every patient has to undergo a very full medical evaluation. We check their heart. We have to make sure they don't have cancer. We want to make sure that there are people who take their medications. And we have them reviewed by a psychologist. And then the case is reviewed by a panel of five to seven kidney specialists or nephrologists. We have more than 250 patients on the QE2 transplant wait list from all over Atlantic Canada. So now I'm going to get a little bit technical, so it'll make you a little easier to understand what Dr. Lusky is talking about. So our biggest barrier now, we, the surgery, we're good at the surgery, we're good at the medical management, but the immune system is a big barrier. In our blood, we have white blood cells and red blood cells. The white blood cells are immune cells, and they're what normally fight off infection. But unfortunately, they cross-react with transplants. We use drugs to try and prevent it, but the drugs don't prevent all types of rejection. They also see blood groups as foreign, so the donor and the recipient have to have the same ABO blood group. So we tend to put A kidneys from people with A blood group into people who have an A blood group. But there's another set of, they're, they're not blood group antigens, but they are kind of like blood group antigens called the human leukocyte antigens. So here we've got a kidney, we've put it in. If these antibodies are present, we have a big problem. The antibodies start attacking the kidney, and in fact, the kidney can be destroyed in it literally in a matter of minutes. Nothing we can do from a drug perspective can make any difference to this. So these antibodies are our biggest problem, and they're, they're the biggest problem for potential kidney transplant recipients. Dr. Liefsky's lab has done some incredible work on identifying these antibodies and doing it in a way that is more efficient, uh, which is going to really help our kidney transplant. Dr. West mentioned already, we perform HLA typing on our patients and donors and we try to see if we can match best donors for our patients as much as we can, but there are so many different HLA antigens that it's very difficult to find a perfect match uh, for e everyone. And so that, that's why we do these uh, HLA antibody tests to make sure that patients don't have antibodies directed against uh, antigens uh, on the donor. And these two pieces of information allow us to predict whether a donor and a patient are going to be compatible, but we cannot really move forward with transplantation until we perform this final lymphocyte cross-match test to really confirm that there are no antibodies against these mismatch antigens. And so this test was actually uh, first invented back in 1964. Dr. Terasaki came up with this cross-match assay, and this assay allows us to test for these antibodies in patients' sera, in patients' blood, against donor human leukocyte antigens. And this test was adopted uh, internationally, and it's been a, a standard uh, for many, many years. And this assay takes quite a bit of time. First, you have to incubate cells with serum, then you have to do these washing steps, then you have a second incubation for 30 minutes, and again, these washing steps, and overall it's about uh, two hours. And on top of that, you also have to isolate the cells before you even begin this test, and that takes about uh, two hours. If the organ is waiting in a preservation solution on ice, the longer this test takes, the more damage the kidney can accrue. We actually get kidneys from all over the country, most often from Ontario and Quebec, and so they uh, are sitting on ice in transit already for even longer when they have to come from uh, these other uh, provinces. So, so really, once the sample and the kidney gets to us, we would like to spend as little time as we can to perform this final test. And this was really the impetus for the research that we were doing. We asked the question, well, could we actually optimize this assay so it doesn't take that long to perform it? And at the same time, we wanted to even improve the result and reliability of the assay. As I mentioned, the cell isolation protocol is, is quite old. It was first invented probably back in the 60s and it's still been used in many labs to this day. But we actually decided to change that and use this very new assay where we are using magnetic beads to pull the unwanted cells uh, back to the magnet and only leaving the lymphocytes, the cells of interest, in the front. And that really speeds up the cell isolation to really less than one hour. Uh, and we're probably the first lab in North America to, to use this uh, type of technique and apply it to the cross-match assay. 
So the first thing that we did was to switch from the regular tube platform to this tray platform, and that saves probably 30 to 40 minutes on an average cross-match assay. It also reduces the error because it's much easier to, with a multi-channel pipe, better to be consistent. And it significantly increases the numbers of samples that we could run simultaneously. So then let's look at this first incubation step where we mix the cells and serum together. And the question we ask is, well, how much time does it really take for the cells and serum to be mixed together, and if you have an antibody there, to see that reaction? And so in the first experiment, we incubated for 30 minutes, just like in the standard protocol. And what this bar tells you is the strength of this. So the higher the bar is, the stronger the reaction. So then we said, okay, what would happen if we only incubated for three minutes? And we were actually quite surprised that a lot of this positivity was already happening within the first three minutes of putting cells and sera together. Then we did five minutes. This is 10 minutes and this is 15 minutes. So you see that by 15 minutes, you're really very close to what you would get with 30 minutes. And you probably don't need to spend all that 30 minutes to get a quiet, nice and positive reaction. Then we looked at that second incubation step where we had the fluorescent antibody to detect the signal. And so again, we incubated first for 30 minutes and we were extremely surprised that when we incubated for five minutes, we got exactly the same reaction. 10 minutes and 15 minutes was the same reaction. And it didn't matter whether the crossmatch was strong or a little weaker or even very weak, we were getting very similar reactions no matter how long we incubated. So incubating for 30 minutes, you're really wasting a lot of time. But of course, theoretically, when you're starting to decrease the amount of time that you're going to allow this reaction to occur, you could get weaker and weaker reaction and you'd be afraid that you may miss uh, some antibodies. So we thought, are there other things that we could change to strengthen the reaction uh, in a cross-match assay? And one of the first things that we looked at was cell number. So many labs that are using the standard protocol use a million cells. So we said, why don't we start decreasing cell numbers to see whether we can see the reaction better? And when we cut the number of cells in half, in fact, as predicted, the reaction went up. If we cut it in another half, it was even stronger. And if we cut it to 125,000 cells, it was even stronger. So we said, okay, well, we could actually change the cross-match assay, use fewer target cells, donor cells, and get a stronger signal, which would then not matter that much that we are incubating uh, for a shorter amount of time. Based on all these experiments and others, we've developed this Halifax cross-match protocol. Instead of four to five hours, we can do it in an hour and a half. We have a very vibrant transplant community in Canada. And so we actually have 14 transplant centers across the country and we do share organs and we have a very nice uh, committee of all the directors that we meet. And during one of the meetings, I brought it up with my colleagues, said that you know, we've developed, we've tried this new assay, it works quite well in our lab. And everybody was interested in testing it out because this long testing is a problem everywhere. And so we decided to evaluate this assay, this cross-match test that we've developed here uh, nationally. This is a representative result of one of the first tests where we sent the same cross-match samples to 14 labs in Canada and we asked them to perform cross-match using their own standard way and then we asked for the results back. So the higher the bar, the stronger the assay and anything above that line means positive. So on this particular cross-match, all the labs in Canada said it's a positive cross-match. Take a guess where the Halifax Protocol Lab is. You're actually wrong, all wrong. We're number 14. <laughs> so despite the fact that our protocol took half the time uh, to do it, we actually got the strongest results. So then we did another test nationally where everybody had to test same samples using their standard cross-match assay. And here are the results. So each lab is a different line. So what you see is that there's a lot of variability again. Different labs are giving this same cross match at different level. They're all positive, but they're very different levels. And then we said, why don't you now repeat that same cross match, but use our technique? And so when labs were using our technique to do those same cross matches, you see that first of all, the cross match was more positive. So it was a better, what we call signal. But at the same time, we were actually closer together. The result consistency was more. And on top of that, even though 
in this exercise, uh, all these other labs used our protocol for the first time ever, they actually got an hour of time saving when they were doing this assay compared to what they've done on their own. And so based on this, we've concluded that this protocol compared favorably with conventional cross-match tests across the country by significantly decreasing the time that it took to perform the assay, improve test results and decrease costs. And it was recommended by our committee that all the labs in Canada will actually adopt this protocol uh, to improve testing and to facilitate equitable national organ sharing because we also want to ensure that the same cross-match looks very similar in all these different labs. We don't want to have variability mm -hmm. in the results from lab to lab. We've had quite a bit of impact. So all labs in Canada are now using this protocol, probably 30 to 40 labs in the USA, all labs in Brazil that use flow cross-match, several labs in UK, Australia, all they have four laboratories and all of them are using it. And then you see other countries where a few laboratories have um, adopted our, our protocol.